so we'll go ahead and get started. We may have some folks join us. I'm Beth Page, and one of the hats I wear here on campus is uh, Title IX coordinator. Uh, we also have our deputy coordinator here, which is uh, Blake Andes. This will be the one instance where the chief is the deputy. <laughs> Figure that one out. Um, but we're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to Title IX. There will, um, there, this is a two-part training, if you will. We'll talk about it uh, this morning, and I'll introduce uh, the concepts of Title IX. And then there is an online training that you uh, will be expected to complete. Uh, it's called The Haven. Uh, all of our uh, new students are also required to complete the Haven training online. Their, their version is a little different than faculty and staff. So for our student ambassadors, um, as long as you complete one, you, you're, you're good to go. Uh, so make sure if you uh, are in, currently in SDV that we talk about that so we can let your instructor know. But all of our SDV students take Title IX training. That's how we introduce them to the concepts. Now, some of you, um, hopefully more than one of you, has heard of Title IX. But when you think of Title IX, which has been around since since the the seventies, what do you think of? Anybody have an idea what they think of with Title IX? Gender equality. Okay. Sports. That is definitely how it was applied for many decades, actually. Um, if you were, come on in. Uh, if you were in in a public school uh, during the seventies and in eighties and nineties, particularly seventies and eighties, you remember that basically what that meant was if, that you had to provide equity in your athletic programs. So that if you had a girls basketball team or a boys basketball team, you needed a girls basketball team. If you had a girls softball team, you needed a boys baseball team. So there needed to be parity between the genders. And for many years, that was how this legislation, it's a pretty short and simply worded legislation, but the uh, application has changed uh, in the last little bit. So that, that, that's the part we're going to focus on today. Uh, the Title IX policy, uh, when you do your Haven, when you complete your Haven training, the policy is uh, listed in the training. It's available, come on in. It's available on the website. Uh, and for faculty and staff, it's important to know where the Title IX policy is located um, so that uh, you can review it and maybe answer questions that you might have that we don't get to today or that you don't find on the online training. Um, anybody have a guess who this might be? She's the first. Yes, she was the first female to complete the Boston Marathon. Her name's Catherine Schweitzer. And one of the officials tried to pull her off the course because women were not allowed to participate. Uh, and she was uh, she did complete with a time of 4:20. And as, uh, for her results, she was subsequently banned by the amateur athletic team. But she registered under the initials KB Swartz. In 1972, hi, come in. In 1972, uh, Title IX is enacted by Congress and signed into law by President Nixon. It's uh, this is the present version of of the uh, law, which was uh, finalized in '75. And again, it's a it's pretty simply worded and short. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So there are lots of ways that we could interpret this, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing happening now, how this is being interpreted is, is expanding. In 2011, we received what's called a Dear Colleague Letter. And anytime you receive one of those from a 
federal agency, you sit up and take notice. So Dear Colleague letters were sent uh, from the Department of Education and the Office of Civil, Civil Rights to higher ed uh, institutions that expanded the interpretation of Title IX to prohibit sexual discrimination and harassment on campus. Basically meaning that uh, the threat of sexual harassment based on gender had, was identified as a barrier to education for some students and therefore unlawful. And, um, and they put some teeth behind it by, by threatening to withhold or uh, have you reimburse federal funds if you're found to be non-compliant. Now, the interpretation of Title IX, if you've been keeping up with the news, is, is a bit fluid at this point. We're going with all the late, what, what legal counsel with the VCCS is telling us. Um, but there are some parts of it that are still probably litigations to come that will uh, clarify some of these pieces. But for now, this is the interpretation that we have. Um, sexual harassment of students including sexual violence that interferes with a student's right to receive an education is a crime. And so that's part of, part of the uh, confusion or complications because Obviously, obviously, I'm not a law enforcement officer. So if I'm investigating a Title IX complaint, I'm investigating it from the point of view of the college. Have we has there been a barrier presented to a student's education? Now, we involve law enforcement because if it crosses the line and it becomes a crime, then there are two parts to this investigation, if that makes sense. But the decisions as a college we can make about, for example, if a student, if there has been a, a founded complaint against a student or an employee and there's some action taken, that's, that's different than if, if they're charged with a crime by our police department and investigate for that. So those, they're two different things. You can, be, you can be expelled from campus and not be charged with a crime, in other words. So we have to be very cognizant from our point of view about how we're handling the investigation. So I, that's just FYI. What I want you all to know is that if you become aware of a situation, what you do about that. That's what we're talking about today. And obviously this applies to employees as well as students, okay? Both the, uh, on either side, of, either side of the the, the umbrella term is called sexual misconduct now, and please bear with me because I'm going to talk about legal definitions of some of these terms, okay? And you'll see them again in your training. Uh, sex discrimination is the unlawful treatment of another based on an individual's sex that includes an individual from participation in, denies the individual the benefits of, or otherwise adversely affects a term or condition of an individual's employment, education, or participation in a college program or activity. Okay? It's very carefully worded. And you will see that again. Sexual misconduct, again, is the umbrella term. Uh, used to uh, a range of behaviors used to obtain sexual gratification against another's will or at the expense of another. Sexual misconduct includes sexual harassment, sexual assault sexual exploitation, and sexual violence, okay? And here's another important term, which probably is at the root of a lot of the, of the cases that are making a big splash in the media, and that is the definition of consent. Consent is, is knowing voluntary and clear permission by word or action to engage in mutually agreed upon sexual activity. Silence does not necessarily constitute consent. Bear with me, I'm still reading. Past consent to sexual activities or a current or previous dating relationship does not imply or ongoing or future consent. Consent to some sexual contact cannot be presumed to be consent for another sexual activity. An individual cannot consent who is under the age of legal consent. 
the existence of consent is based on the totality of the circumstances, including the context in which the alleged incident occurred. Now, if you've been keeping track, uh, there's a, a explosive case that's been playing out in the media for over the last year at EVA. And uh, it began with an article in Rolling Stone magazine from uh, a student who, at UVA, who says she was gang raped at a frat party. Okay, it was a horrendous story. So that story has played out in the media in a lot of ways that, um, one, it did bring attention to Title IX and the purpose of Title IX, but since then, the story has come under question. And there's even some, some lawsuits being filed about that because UVA has suffered a lot of uh, damage potentially from this story and they're saying that it didn't happen. Okay, so this is playing out. So when you see all these stories, and there are 70, 80 or more colleges and universities currently under investigation by the Department of Ed Office of Civil Rights for violation of Title IX. And with most uh, with most of these uh, monitoring, uh, when the Department of Ed or some federal agency is monitoring you, typically when you get in trouble is, I mean, an incident, if it happens on your campus, there is some examination about what could have been done to prevent it. But usually the most harsh consequences are how you handled the report once, it, once you became aware of it. So, um, so employees in higher ed institutions all across the country are probably sitting through a similar seminar somewhere right now as classes begin to start and students too. Because it's real important as an institution that one, that we have an awareness campaign, people understand what Title IX is, um, that we're educating you and our students about what to do if you become aware of some uh, issue amongst students and or faculty staff. Uh, that who do you report that to? How do you report that? Okay, and we do have a Title IX complaint form that's on the web page that has some simplistic questions for you to answer. You, you just fill it out and hit submit, and it comes straight to me. If uh, you're not sure what to do about it and you don't even remember my name, you can type in Title IX coordinator at bhcc.edu, write it in an email, it will come to you. As long as I have some contact information, I can follow up with you. We have several people on the campus who are certified <coughs> to investigate complaints. Our human resource officer, Laura McClellan, obviously <coughs> Chief Andes. Um, we also have, um, Blake, who in your division is an investigator for Title IX? Uh, just about all of them. Okay. They can take, they can take a complaint and investigate. Robin Wagner also has been trained. So there are lots of people that can, depending on the nature of the complaint, who can help investigate. But it kind of starts with me, so I get the ball rolling. If in my absence, or if it's easier to get hold of, obviously you can start the ball rolling too. Either way. Also covered under Title IX on campus is stalking. And we have had incidents of stalking on uh, where there might be uh, a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. Uh, and, uh, for example, we, uh, we've had several instances of there being a, a breakup or, there, or some kind of problem in a, a relationship. And the girlfriend is a student here on campus and the boyfriend is not, but the boyfriend comes to campus and tries to gain access to her schedule or hangs around outside her class waiting on her to get out. We have had situations like that. Obviously, those are things we need to know about. If uh, someone can let us know, we can, nothing else, uh, you know, have a police officer in the hallway when the class dismisses. But there are actions we can take uh, if we know about them. So stalking is covered under this too. Also, the, um, the Violence Against Women Act, which is commonly called VAWA, but you can remember that. Uh, but it's also covered under Title IX on campus, and that, and those, and those are domestic violence situations. And and it's not just um, 
these do not just cover you know, actions against females. Also covers our male employees, faculty, staff, and students. So um, it, it doesn't say, um, Title IX is not designed primarily to protect women. It's just saying that gender cannot be a barrier to education. So it goes, it does not apply strictly or only, I should say, to females. Okay, domestic violence. Also, is, as we talked about part of this, we do have awareness campaigns about domestic violence. We will have them on campus in the spring. We will have agencies in from our community who have information about their services uh, to make available to all of the community, all of the college community members. And domestic violence. Um, can you start over? <laughs> okay, sorry. Probably not, really. <laughs> Domestic violence uh, covers not just people who are uh, married, but people who might be cohabitating or uh, in a relationship with someone. Uh, so it, it covers more than just a, a family living in a single home. Uh, dating violence, and, this, and we may see more potential for this on our campus too, uh, as a result of a breakup or just an abusive relationship. You may notice um, you may notice a student's behavior or even marks on a student in your class, and uh, there may be an opportunity for you to you know hey are you okay everything okay just have an opportunity to to inquire about that and I realize some of you are going to be more comfortable doing that than others, uh, but if there's a situation that you're concerned about but you don't feel comfortable asking. You know, there are people on campus who, you know, you can let me know, you can let uh, the academic counselors know, you can let people in Excel know, you can let the college success coaches know, you can let campus police know. There will be people who, who uh, can find a way to check on the student to see if everything's going okay. And, and sometimes uh, just asking the question uh, is what they need so that they can uh, talk about what's going on. Uh, we had a, a student last term who uh, I required to check in with me at least once a week because she reported she was in an abusive relationship. She was trying to leave and she was trying to put together a, a plan to leave. Uh, and so trying to help her figure out what her resources were and who could help her with that. But that was really important and I just had to eyeball her. I needed to do that to make sure she was okay. Do I have any questions about anything so far? We do have a threat assessment team on campus, which is something that uh, was created in Virginia after the, the shootings at Virginia Tech. And uh, so, so our college campuses now have threat assessment teams. They consist of uh, different people on campus with different responsibilities. Uh, Blake and I are both on the threat assessment team. We have other counselors. We have Dr. Thomas. We have HR. So we have different people on that, and the purpose of that, let's say for example, you give a writing assignment in your class, or uh, some project in your class, and there's there's something about that that a person has contributed that is very disturbing to you, you're not quite sure what to make of it. Um, that would, you know, you could come talk with someone on the third assessment team about that. We ha actually had a student stalking a faculty member last fall. And uh, we, she initially filed a report that he was harassing her. And through our investigation, we discovered that it was the other way around. And um, that was very stressful for the faculty member and for those of us trying to figure out exactly what was happening. But we uh, processed that through the threat assessment team. And the threat assessment team can make recommendations about uh, asking a student to leave campus. Uh, through Title IX, we can do that on a temporary basis, too. For example, if, if there's an incident between two students and they're in the same class, and a person has come forward saying they're fearful of this person, we can ask that person to not come to class and while the investigation is going on. Um, so if you're a faculty member, you may, I may approach you and say, can you arrange for outside class work for the student? I may not be able to tell you all the details.
talk about um, here are some, here are the on campus resources again we've talked about. Anytime there's any kind of threatening situation on campus, call 911 immediately. Of course, you have to dial 8 to get an outside line. But as soon as you dial that, our campus police are automatically notified. Any threat of imminent harm, do that immediately. Uh, but if there's a situation you need to report about Title IX or something you're aware of that's not happening in the moment, <coughs> contact one of us. Let's talk about the limits of confidentiality. And this is probably one of the hardest pieces for a lot of people. But a student may come to you and say, I need to tell you something, but you can't tell anyone. Well, that puts you in a really tough spot. So you need to be able to know what to say. Because you have to be able to say, well, I certainly will try to keep it confidential, but there's some things you know I can't. If it has to do with harming, harming, you know, somebody being harmed, or, or something I need to report, you know, I might not be able to keep that to myself. And see if you can talk around it for a minute till the person feels comfortable and understands that they're going to tell you something that they understand may have to be disclosed. And if during that conversation you're uncomfortable, that would be a time to say, you know, there are people on our campus who talk, who are trained just for this, and uh, could I will sit in the room with you, um, and let's let let's have you talk to them. That's an option that you, you have if you're not comfortable in that situation. But there are, uh, it's, don't put yourself in that situation. There are some confidences you simply cannot keep. If a person comes to you and they're telling you just, you know, they're having a difficult time and they have not disclosed something specific you think needs to be reported, but you want to refer them to outside agencies here. Here are some choices. We have the Bristol Crisis Center. We have Abuse Alternatives. In Smith County, we have Family Resource Center. And those phone numbers are published on, in Title IX policy on our website. We also have a contract with Highlands Community Services. Um, so that if we have a student that we feel needs um, services immediately, um, we can arrange, uh, the college will pay for the first visit, and then the student can pay a sliding scale fee or if they have insurance, they will pay the fee after that. So uh, you can uh, ask anyone in Excel, this Excel program, uh, Blake or myself, and we can authorize that service and make the referral to send them to talk to one of us about that. As I said, you will be asked to complete um, an online training that's much more detailed than what, what uh, we're talking about today. And it's called The Haven, and I will send an email to you with instructions, a link you can click on to get to the site, instructions on how to log in. It will take, the, the first part will take about an hour to complete. There's a, and you can, uh, if you need to work on it for 30 minutes, go, you know, log out, come back in, you can do that. And it'll pick right back up where you run. Um, and once you complete that, there's about a two week window of time that has to pass and then you'll get an email, it's time to complete part two. And it's about 15 minutes. The purpose of part two is to find out how much information you're retaining. And uh, I can uh, go to the website and, and see who has completed the training or where they are in the process. And again, this is a federal and state requirement that all employees have this training, so I really need for you to complete it. Um, when I send out, um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of time to finish it. Um, I'll send out the notice, I'll have a completion date on there so that you can work on it as you have time. Okay, that in a nutshell is Title IX. There's a lot of um, legal speak, if you will, in, in the policy. So I'm um, trying to think of a practical scenario. Um, but first
first, I'll just open it up for questions. I can tell you that faculty members, counselors, and coaches, that's who students are going to make these disclosures to because you're most likely to be the one they have a relationship with. Uh, so I particularly want those folks to know what to do. Uh, and I'll tell you something else too. Uh, you may walk through the wolf's den and observe something happening. And you'll need to you know, talk to somebody about that. Because once we know, we have to address it. And uh, that, you know, you may, it may be obvious that, that there's a person in there who's not uh, voluntarily participating in what's happening. And that, that may raise a red flag for you. I'm trying to think of a scenario. campuses because we do not have dormitories um, we do not always know what's going on in our students lives the institutions that are residential title nine takes on a whole different dimension uh, than for a commuter school um, and the responsibilities are greater for those schools too um, most of the time you may if, if something is happening in a student you'll hear it it from the student about something that's happened off campus oversight. But we are still responsible for responding to what they're telling us. And it, they could be talking about someone, and many times we'll be talking about someone who is not a student on our campus that um, has, this has occurred. With. And we may have to involve uh, local law enforcement off, off campus in the situation just depending on what's, what's going on. And, and when a criminal investigation should occur, then the internal investigation kind of stops until that plays out. It kind of takes precedent over the internal investigation. Got anything to contribute, Chief, before I'm leaving out? The most likely things, I'm just thinking about things we've heard. Knock on wood, everything we knock on, we have not had a whole lot of complaints. Or, you know, serious allegations come to our attention. Um, we have had some. And I also can tell you that most of the, most of the complaints are going to come in after these awareness campaigns are happening and students are being trained. Uh oh, I need to report that. So don't be surprised if the first of the semester is when you start hearing things from students, especially new students, because they're the ones who are going to be completing the Haven training. I have a question about the Haven training. Um, as, as a student, I did the Haven training in the spring. Mm -hmm. Like, would, would those of us who have completed already be required to do the faculty? No. Okay. No, I think one time through, you're good to go. Okay. Other questions? Are there government agencies that measure our response? Efficacy. At this point, uh, you're only being that would only be evaluated if there had been some uh, complaint filed against the university for failure to respond. And that's what you're seeing with some of the major colleges and universities where athletes have been charged with something, and, and then the Department of Education comes in and investigates everything at that. That's just been because it plays out in the media. That's what people have become most aware of. But it's happening. of the resources here on campus if you find yourself in a situation you're not sure to do reach out you know reach out and and, uh, and even if you you are not quite just something's just not quite right just come talk to one of us about that it's just nagging at you you know just something's not quite right about the situation Thank you.
thank you all very much. You'll be hearing from me soon to complete your, your Haven training. Make sure that your name's on the sign-in sheet so you get credit. <coughs>